What's up guys, Kudokun here. If you happen to not know who I am, if you're from the Scattered Nexus community, um, basically I'm somebody who dedicates a lot of their time and energy into indie card games in particular. Um, I play card games on a somewhat competitive level, and uh, indie card game developers will often get a hold of me to stress test their game, see if there's anything within it uh, that can be broken by players before it gets into consumer hands. Lately, I've been dedicating a lot of time to Scattered Nexus. I was introduced to it a few years ago, but have really been getting into it this last week or so. I've been out of the, I've been out of the community for a little while, but here I am, and uh, <laughs> I, I can't just do something a little bit. It's either I have no interest in it and I just don't touch it at all, or I dedicate my every waking hour and breath to it to the point where I completely exhaust myself. So that's kind of where we're at here. And uh, what we're pretty much just going to make a video today about it. Um, originally, I thought I would maybe just make like a review for each of the sets that are currently out. Uh, but I thought maybe it'd be a little bit more interesting to just do one concise video giving my thoughts on every single set that's out. Because I do also have a plan on making uh, a sort of deck for each of the current sets that are out to sort of give a little bit of life to the community, uh, give you some ideas uh, to deck building or whatever if you happen to if you happen to be stuck or if you're just looking for something fun to do with the game. I should have some interesting deck ideas for you to try out or some things for you to think about, but I digress. So um, basically, I'm just going to give my thoughts on every one of the sets. Um, I've got a little randomizer over here, so I, I kind of like the chaotic energy of not knowing which uh, set I'm going to be talking about next. I'm not going to be doing it in any particular order. I literally have a randomizer open right now, and it's going to tell me what order to talk about the sets in. And yeah, um, it's important to note that I'm going to be rating these based on their viability. <laughs> I am a card game player, and I'm going to be judging these sets based on how well they work in the card game so i'm not going to be judging them based on their flavor or uh how well they adapt the source material as much as i love to do that stuff normally i feel like there's enough love for that going around right now and uh, i need to be the counterbalance a little bit and <laughs> come in and just talk about how well the cards work as cards within a card game so uh feel free to take what i say with a little grain of salt i my, my opinions aren't coming out of nowhere. I'm not just a salty player who lost a couple of matches and I'm now complaining about some of the stuff that he lost against. Um, I have been doing this for a very, very long time. I do have what I think is a fairly educated opinion. Uh, so when I go into a game and I talk about it, just keep that in mind. Um, you can disagree with it, but it's not coming out of nowhere. I, I do have uh, some reason to believe the things that I believe. So... Could be wrong about some stuff, and if you think I'm wrong about anything, this tier list will be available to you as well. It'll be in the comments section below, so feel free to uh, load that bad boy up and follow along with me. <laughs> but uh, I digress. Let's go ahead and talk about how the tier list is actually going to work. Uh, there are five tiers. Of course, we need there to be a middle, a balanced tier. So if anything goes here, it just means that it is pretty much exactly where it needs to be power-wise, and it's going to be the sort of bar that um, the other ones will sort of fall around. So if it's A, it means I think it actually stands pretty significantly above the ones in B tier. If it's S, um, that's you're actually trying to win tier, so if it goes here, it means that uh, it should really only be used if it's really important to you that you win something, uh, it's the absolute best of the best that you can play right now, and so when it comes to card game viability, um, it means that if you pick it, there is a significantly higher chance that you will win. So if you're just looking for the absolute best cards, there'll be an S tier. Now, below B, we have first C, not quite there yet, so if you're in C tier, it means that uh, there's potential, uh, it could be good maybe later in the future, or it's it's almost pretty good, or it does something kind of cool, but just it's it's not it's not strong enough for me to consider it among the balanced tier. So it's not good enough to be balanced, but but maybe it's kind of neat. <laughs> I, I can give it that. 
Um, and then lastly, D tier, uh, you poor bastards. It's basically the tier that I'm going to be putting sets in that um, they're maybe kind of cool, but uh, they're just not good at all. <laughs> they got screwed really hard by something. It's um, I'll, I'll get more into it when we actually start putting cards in here, but just know that it, they're the sets that I feel really bad for because there's something making them absolutely awful within the game, and until that gets sorted, I, I just don't recommend anybody even try to play with them, unless you're just playing around for fun, which it, it's totally fine, I guess. So, yeah, um, like I said before, we're going to be doing this randomly, so I don't know which set I'm going to be looking at first, but you'll notice that I do have two copies of each one. I have one labeled S and one labeled G. Um, so S is going to be solo viability. It's going to be how well the set itself works without any other factors um, associated to it, right? So how cohesive the set is and how well it works on its own. And then we have G, which is the group ranking, which is how well it supports a different set. So S is solo, G is group, S is how good it is on its own, G is how well it works with the other sets, or how much it brings to the other sets when used alongside them. Intro was unnecessarily long, let's go ahead and just get into it now. Uh, according to this, the first set we're going to be looking at is Shadow Hunters. Shadow Hunters is a pretty neat set. The most notable things it does is it manipulates impact, and then uh, there are cards within it that let you destroy the lowest or steal the lowest impact characters on the field. So there's some really fun things you can do within Shadow Hunters where you can sort of manipulate what the strongest and weakest cards on your opponent's side of the field are, and then you can play around it to either steal their weakest characters or destroy their weakest characters, or you can steal their weakest character and then destroy their next weakest character. Um, there's a lot of really interesting things you can do there with field manipulation, which is my thing. My favorite thing within any card game is the ability to steal cards from my opponent's side of the field. Um, it's so much value, and there are some really clever tricks you can do within that. So um, I really like it. Not only does it have my favorite game mechanic, but uh, it's also got tits. And <laughs> I mean, I'm, pr I'm a pretty simple guy. Uh, you show me some sexy cartoon ladies. Uh, I'm all over it. So it's got everything that I could possibly ever want. However, um, this is where things get a little bit shaky here. So first things first, when it comes to solo viability, definitely balanced. I, I wouldn't say for a second that it's not balanced. It's really, really well made. Um, it, it has a really nice flow within itself. I'd say the only thing holding it back is it, it is very dependent on the other sets that you have alongside it um, because it runs out of steam so quick. Uh, nothing within it recycles and uh, you can really only do its trick like once. <laughs> like once you pull it off, a couple of times like i'd say like two to three turns in you're kind of out of tricks to play and you kind of just have to rely on the advantage that you get from doing it's a little steal a character destroy a character weaken a character to make it a viable target for destroying or stealing um so all of that's good i'd say it's a fairly balanced set if you put it in something that will um uh give it more steam then it can be really really good but overall i'd say it's a really really balanced set um, though, as far as how much it brings to the table to other sets, um, I'd say it's not quite there. Um, it just doesn't bring very much to other sets, right? It, it's a very, very, um, <laughs> it's a very, very, uh, top-heavy sort of concept, right? You have to build the deck around Shadowhunters. Shadowhunters brings very little to other sets, in terms of supporting a different uh, faction. But if you're just building a deck around Shadow Hunters, I think it's really, really cool. And it, it can bring a little bit to the table if you're already doing something within the realm that it's already doing. So yeah, it's really, really good on its own. Um, doesn't bring as much to the table as a support set, but what are you gonna do? Okay, next up is Edge. Um, so, all superhero sets are going to be uh, a little bit busted. Um, this is something that I talked about 
literally years ago I talked about this. The superhero sets are the best sets in the game. So they're definitely going to be pretty highly marked now. Uh, I don't want to spoil anything, but uh, Edge isn't anywhere near as good as Dauntless. Um, it's still extremely good. It's, it's a lot more balanced than Dauntless is. Um, but let's go ahead and talk about it. So Edge, just like the other superhero faction that we currently have, um, has a ton of effects to play around. And it doesn't sacrifice any impact in order to get its amazing effects. Um, it is extremely consistent when it comes to card draw. It's extremely consistent when it comes to activating weaken effects. Because it literally has a character within it that can bounce characters back to hand. Um, this is something that I've used in a few decks now that uh, can be manipulated to be a little bit more powerful than I think uh, Slim thinks it is. Uh, I have heard from the video that he made on the set, actually on his channel, that um, Interim, the card that can bounce characters back to hand, has gone through a lot of changes, and uh, I can definitely see why those changes have happened, but I also think that uh, I also think the set is still a little bit more powerful than even he thinks it is. Um, it's a really, really, really good set. Again, all the superhero sets are going to be... They're going to be the best sets because they have amazing effects. And because of the impact power balancing, they're never going to have to sacrifice any impact to get the amazing effects that they have. Um, so superhero sets are always just going to be super, super high tier. Um, it's got a lot of card draw in it. Uh, it's got a lot of field control in it. Um, it has really 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 good events it's fairly balanced in the event department compared to some of the other sets but overall i'd say that it's still good enough that they deserve fairly high tier um i'm going to say that on their own i mean on their own i'd say that they're probably still really good i'm gonna go ahead and put them in stronger than average um they're they're just they're, they're a superhero set. Like, what can you possibly say? They're they're a superhero set, so they work really good just on their own. Um, I will say though, when it comes to them bringing something to the table for other sets, they're probably a little bit more balanced. I'd say. Um, they're they're another very selfish faction, kind of like Shadow Hunters. You have to really build around if you want to get there. Uh, full power out on the field, so I'm kind of happy with them being balanced uh, as a sort of secondary synergy, but they still bring a lot. Like, Interim by herself being able to bounce cards back to the hands is just... It's so obnoxious. <laughs> you can use it to do some very, very interesting loopy stuff. You can weaken a character to get its weaken ability... Uh, then we can interim, bounce that character, play that character again fresh, and then weaken it again to use its ability again. Um, you can use interim to bounce stuff from your opponent's side of the field. If you like, if you pair this up with a healing faction, then uh, you can just uh, bounce, heal, bounce, heal, bounce, heal. You, you can do some really, really silly stuff with it. It's it's superheroes, okay? Superhero things. That's just how it is. Okay. Next up is Demon Eater. All right, so Demon Eater. Um, <sighs> Demon Eater's neat because it utilizes a mechanic that doesn't often get utilized, um, and that's kind of cool. But being real, uh, it's not quite there. <laughs> not by itself, it's just it's not quite there. Um, as an idea, I really like it. It's cool. Um, I like the entire face-down card mechanic, and there's a lot of really cool things that face-down cards can do that, once again, I don't think anybody has fully tapped into the power of face-down cards. They are amazing, <laughs> because face-down cards are every single faction at the same time, or sorry, every single genre, they are every single genre at the same time. So they dodge all of the worst effects, 
um, but can also be the target for any effect that you really want them to be. Uh, they can always attack because they are always within color synergy of whatever the color that you call for their um, attack is going to be. Um, they're really cool in concept. The problem is they're just not strong enough to have a win condition. Um, like, the, the main thing that you're supposed to do is use the scared trait and then um, sort of bounce scare between characters by killing a character with alpha and then the next character gets scared and then maybe you can kill them too. That's fine in theory, but it's really hard to utilize well. Because for one, um, your, your events are actually pretty good, so I don't think that I would want to actually give my scared trait cards to any of my opponent's characters, because their effects are just naturally better than trying to pull off the one-two combo of, here's the scared trait, by the way, I've got a second card, and this one's this one's gonna get you. Um, they're fine, again, in theory, they're, they're fine. There's nothing necessarily wrong with them. It's just, they, they don't really... They don't really have enough of a win condition on their own to be that good. Like, I, I would prefer either of these two sets that we've already looked at to playing Demon Eater. Now, when it comes to bringing something to the table for other sets, what they bring, again, it's, it's good for the niche that it's in, but it's still not that good. And the niche that it brings is so limited, it can really only support, like, two of the factions that are out right now to any degree. Because most factions don't want to play face-down cards. <laughs> uh, they don't care about face-down cards. There's really no reason to do it. But for, like, the two factions that do do face-down cards, it can bring something, kind of. Even in those cases, I still don't know, man. Yeah, they're, they're not quite there in, in either case. Um, hopefully more is done with them in the future, but right now, um, I think I'd prefer to, to skip over them if I was going to play anywhere competitively. Okay, next up we have Lost Reaper, one of my personal favorite sets. Um, I know I said that I wasn't going to bring up artwork or anything, but artwork-wise, it's it's one of my favorite-looking sets, and uh, I really enjoy the way it plays. It's got a card in it that lets you sacrifice a card on your side of the field, and your opponent sacrifices a card on their side of the field, which is um, makes it a pretty good set on its own, because there are definitely some interesting tricks that you can play within the set itself to really utilize what the set is capable of. It's got a four power vanilla. It's got um, one of the best, one of the absolute best events in the entire game that works as both Monster Reborn and Call of the Haunted at the same time. It lets you revive a character from either player's discard pile. It's such a banger. Um, and it's just, overall, it's a pretty good set. Um, I really like, again, its ability to sacrifice something from both sides of the field and um, sort of play around damaging both you and your opponent at the same time, but somehow making sure that you're the one who's getting more value out of it. Um, on its own, it's just it's really consistent. It's very, very good, especially, especially if you build it as a centerpiece. You can do some of the nuttiest things in the game using next reaper set um so on its own it is um chef's kiss it's it's so good it's one of my favorite sets in the entire game right now because of the way it plays now when it comes to what it brings to other sets this is where things are a little bit tricky i'm gonna say that they're balanced now here's the reason right so the whole making your opponent sacrifice a character and then you sacrificing a character thing, you can make that work in just about any set, right? If you're having trouble uh, sort of working around it, I'm going to give you a, a small a small uh, tidbit, okay? You can just take a card, put it face down, and then sacrifice it for blind's effect. Done. 
you got rid of something that you don't really need, and your opponent gets rid of something on the field before they have a chance to play any cheap fodder to do anything about it. Um, it's just that when it comes to what it brings, if you're not building specifically around it and its gimmicks, um, it can be a little bit more challenging, but the fact that it brings such powerful event cards to the table means that it can't go below balanced. It's There's no way that I would ever be crazy enough to say that a, a set that brings the events that this card does can go into not quite there. On top of that, it has one of the best chump blockers in the game in the form of Grim, who just immediately vaporizes anything that he fights. If you build around that, it's really good. And honestly, I don't think there's a single deck out there that doesn't want Grim in the deck and doesn't want Monster Reborn in the deck. So I'd say it's pretty balanced where it is. Alrighty, next up we're looking at La 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 Lucha. Now, I have to sort of cling to Lucha here because uh, my personal favorite genre of reading material, movie, television show, anything, my favorite just genre in general is mystery. I'm not getting a whole lot of love over here. Okay, Rey Mysterio is kind of the only kind of mystery that I'm getting out of this game. So, um, luckily for me, it's fairly decent for what it is. So, I, I'm not too thrown out. But, I mean, when it comes to actually ranking it, I, I like the set a lot. And you can do some really interesting, nutty stuff with the, the set. Um... Eventually, I'm going to make some decks to show you guys, and you guys are going to see. I use the Lucha set a lot because it can do some nutty stuff, but within its own little ecosystem, I wouldn't say that it does enough to be that impressive. It's good. It's balanced, I'd say. It's very balanced. Um, but... It, it needs a little bit of support to, to really get going. It doesn't need as much support as some of these other sets here, but on its own, it's very tough to justify that Lucha is actually going to be one of the more meta viable decks. Um, investigate just doesn't give you enough value. Um, I'd rather play something like Edge that lets me continuously draw cards than I would can control what card is on the top of my deck. Um, you can, again, make that work with some other sets. Uh, de I'm definitely going to show some of that stuff off at some point later, but I'd say that the idea is really interesting, but if you don't build specifically around it, the idea is kind of not worth it. They also suffer from having currently one of the worst locations in the entire game because there's just nothing you can do with it. Um, because there's not enough mystery characters for it to really be that viable. So, it's neat. Uh, I enjoy it. It's the only mystery that's currently in the in the game, so I can't be too hard on it. But on its own, it's it's just, it's balanced. It's, it's pretty good. Now, as for what it brings to another set, that's, that's a toughie. I'm going to go ahead and say that this is probably not quite there. Um, again, I don't think that uh, the mechanics on their own really work that well or bring enough to the table to another set for me to say that they they should be chosen as like a support set to a lot of sets. They can do amazing things within some sets. They can, okay? Uh, talk to me about Lucha and uh, Damage Inc. working together. That's great. I love it. But also... Unless you're using very specific decks to make this work, it doesn't bring anything to the table. Like if you're already, uh, if you've already chosen something else to be the centerpiece of your deck, there's almost no reason. <coughs> excuse me. There's almost no reason to ever bring Lucha as well, um, unless you specifically have a way to either steal your opponent's characters so that when you play Cosmic Beatdown, you can sort of. Uh, hit both their characters at the same time, or if you are pairing them up with something like Damage Inc. that uh, one already does a lot of um, character damage, so you can get a lot of value out of it, or something that can continuously heal your side of the field, but even then, 
even then, that's that. See, that's the really tough thing is Rey Mysterio himself is really like the only good card when it comes to the character lineup that you actively want to be playing around. Yeah, there's uh, there's the other guy too that when he drops, he deals the damage, but I mean, that's not that impressive. Uh, it's not really that abusable, so you can't really get that much value out of it. Ray Mysterio himself is an amazing card, but if you're not building a deck that specifically does something with how amazing he is, it, it really doesn't bring that much to the table. So that's that's where I'll put it. Um, it doesn't bring enough to the table for me to say that it's good enough to uh, use as a support uh, color, but if you're using it as like your main color, it's it's pretty good. Dauntless. I had to talk about this at some point. Oh, Dauntless. <laughs> Years ago, when Eli brought this game to me, I, I told him, I made it very clear, Dauntless is the hands-down best set in the entire game and it's not even close and years later it persists i'm sorry but there is absolutely nothing in the game that comes close to the power that dauntless has it is not balanced well at all um it has the most impact of like any set out there don't don't come to me with your numbers, okay, when it comes to just pure value from impact characters, um, they are the strongest when it comes to just dealing a ton of damage in one turn. Not only do they have the highest power vanilla in the entire game, but every single one of the characters in this set is a win condition by itself. Every single car is a win condition. <laughs> It's crazy! They have the best weaken effects in the entire game. So you've got one guy who can deal damage or prevents damage. It's, it's wonderful that you get the choice. You can either make it impossible for your opponent to counter your field, or you can just straight up uh, minx their field out of existence. You've got one character that can infinitely recycle event cards, and there are some nutty event cards that you want to be recycling. Like if you can just get it every single turn, man, you can you can do some really really nutty stuff. You've got one character who is so ridiculously powerful. He can he by himself. He can just minx like ten cards off the top of your deck with one attack. It's crazy. Like, I get that he's supposed to be the Hulk, but my god, this guy is so obnoxious because he's something that, if your opponent doesn't do something about him immediately, they lose the game, right? And that's, that's not, it's not even close. It's not even close when it comes to the amount of problems that the other sets bring to the table. Dauntless, every single card is a win condition. You can build around any character that you want. Um, and if that wasn't enough for you, they also have the best defensive event in the entire game. He just get everything. <laughs> so, not only does their defensive card completely negate an attack, but it also deals damage to the character, to a character, right? And on top of that, you can give its trait to one of your characters if you don't need to negate a, a character's attack. <laughs> like, it's so ridiculously good. It's so good. Um, and again, it's not even close. <laughs> like, I'm sure there are some people out there that are thinking to themselves right now, Oh, but Kudo, I, I totally, I, one time, I actually countered a Dauntless deck. Um, if somebody's coming at you with a 10 impact Hulk, all you gotta do is block it, Kudo. That's not how card games work. That's not how any of this works. Card games are not complicated, okay? There are three steps to making a competitive deck. Step one, you find a win condition. Step two, 
You build around making that win condition happen as consistently as possible. Step three, you figure out the least amount of resources you can in making that win condition happen so that you can dedicate the rest of your deck towards other win conditions once the first win condition falls through. And the Hulk guy himself being able to one-shot your opponent's deck if played around is nuts. Even if you have some kind of counter to it, you have the rest of Dauntless to deal with. It's just, again, it's not even close. Dauntless was a problem four years ago when I first saw the game. It's still at the exact same amount of power, if not more powerful nowadays. And it's, it's just, it's really good. Um, Dauntless is the meta deck to be playing with if you're just looking for something to play with to actually win the game. If you're not trying to have fun and you actually just want to win, Dauntless is the set that you would be playing. Like, Dauntless is so, so good, but I've talked about it too much. Let's go ahead and talk about its grouping. Now, as good as Dauntless is on its own, I'd actually have to say that when it comes to... When it comes to supporting other colors, it's actually just as good. <laughs> it's, it's dauntless, bro. I'm not putting that anywhere near C tier. Dauntless is S tier. If you are going to use it by itself, it's amazing. If you're going to use it to support another color, it's amazing. What color does not want dauntless as a support? Which one? You could use the entire front row, just Dauntless characters, and they bring in some amazing tools in their events that will make your win conditions even better. Everybody wants Dauntless. What's that? Your, your, the set that you're going to play has an amazing event card? Let me go ahead and recycle that for you, bro. Oh, hey, your, your deck doesn't really do very much damage? Well, here, let me, let me go ahead and deal that damage for you, bro. What you just need? You just need to punch something in the face. Five power. <laughs> Dauntless is so good that I think if you played against me in a fun match with Dauntless, I would just take that personally. <laughs> I would assume that you just had a problem with me, like, as a human being, if you used Dauntless against me in a match. I think I'd rather you just straight up call me a racial slur than I would you play against me using a Dauntless deck. But okay, alright. It exists. Trying to win. The any tier zero deck that exists for this game is going to have to have Dauntless in it. Um, Dauntless, if I ever, if I ever need to win a match, I'm going to be using Dauntless. Like if I'm playing with Dauntless, that's the equivalent of me. I'm no longer messing around. This is no longer a game for me. I I just need to Rochambeau you real quick because. This is this match actually like I need to win, right? That's if I ever pick up Dauntless, okay, the room should go silent because it means that I actually need to win. So I'm going to win. But that's that's it. That's that's where we'll leave it. Okay. So as a palate cleanser from uh the absolute nightmare that is Dauntless's existence. Uh, we get to talk about one of my personal favorite sets. Probably, actually, now that I'm looking over the list here, actually, yeah, my favorite set in the game, uh, that's gonna go ahead and be Blintz. Not only do I love the artwork and the characters and whatever that come from it, um, you know, overall, it's just a really, really cool set. It's got, um, it's, it has the best event card in the game, um, the one that lets you steal cards from your opponent's side of the field. Obviously, you already know that I love that, but this is even better. It's a way better version of it. Uh, one, because you don't really have to like weaken a character or anything. You can just you know snag a character real quick. And if it's not a tragedy character, you get to discard a card from your hand. Oh, whoops, did I say get to? 
My bad slip of the tongue. I meant, yeah, you have to discard a card from your hand. Grr, discarding a card from your hand, it's, it's so it's rough. I hate it. <laughs> um, so um, within its own ecosystem, Blint is pretty amazing. It's uh, very, very consistent. It has a very, very fun win condition in the form of Blint himself, who basically um, you allow yourself to take some damage, and then you ruffle through the damage that you took for a good character, and then you blint that character into existence, and uh, it gives you a, a gives you a lot of um, it gives you a lot of consistency, and uh, it's just a very very fun thing to do. Um, it's something you have to play around. It's not totally broken because you have to be very careful about when you blint it. But once you actually blint it into existence, then you play another card, steal a card from your opponent's side of the field, um, and overall, it's really fun. Now, I'd say that it's not it's not totally like up there on its own because there's there's some there's some dead weight. Um, for one, I don't I'm not impressed at all with the cats that lets you uh, that gets one power for every card that gets erased. Um, Blinth by itself doesn't erase cards consistently enough for that card to ever be viable for anything. Um, it's pretty much just fodder. Like, I, it pretty much exists solely to be used as fodder for something else. I, I've never one time had that, uh, cat thing actually do something in a match that was useful to me whatsoever, but... I mean, the rest of the set's pretty good. I'd say at least half of the set is some of the best stuff that you're going to find in the entire game. Again, both of the events are good. The uh, Steel event is the best event in the entire game. And on top of that, you have an event that changes colors, which is amazing. Your opponent declares that they're attacking with blue characters. You make a character not blue, and now that character can't attack for the turn. Um, your opponent plays a card that says... Uh, return a non-slice-of-life character to the hand. Uh, boom! That character actually is slice-of-life. It totally just dodged your events. Not only does it fizzle events, but it negates attacks, and you can use it to do some really, really fun stuff on your side of the field, too. Oh, what's that? Uh, Interim needs to return a character that isn't a superhero to hand. Well, that character isn't a superhero. I'm gonna return that boy to my hand, and we're gonna we're gonna have a good old time. I'm gonna go ahead and blinth something into existence. Interim, return that to my hand. Blinth again. I'm going. To, I'm gonna use blinth to play a superhero and use its on play effect, and then I'm going to uh, make that superhero not a superhero and heal interim, and then return that superhero to my hand, and then play it again. You can do some really really fun stuff with blinth. Uh, I very, very much enjoy it, but also, again, um, it's got a lot of dead weight in it when it comes to, uh, first of all, not Blint himself, and then not the two events. Blint and the two events are really, like, the thing that hold this entire set together. Now, I'd say when it comes to bringing something to the table for another set, actually, though, um, that's where things get a lot better. Um, Blint on its own, it's... Eh. But if you use Blinth, first of all, you are, again, bringing the best events in the game to the table. Um, you have the amazing color coordination card. That's amazing. And then Blinth himself is a win condition. Uh, you take a little bit of damage and then Blinth something into existence. Or if you deal some damage or if you're in a very damage heavy deck, then Blinth revive something that you killed, and it's amazing. Um, especially, especially if you are playing a deck that already lets you uh, bounce things back to hand. Blinth, bounce, blinth is just, that's Dutch GG. <laughs> like, you can do some really, really fun stuff with it. So it does, it actually brings a lot more to the table for other decks than it does uh, being a viable, like, core center of your deck itself. Um, so yeah, I'm very, very impressed with Blint when it comes to being a support for other sets. It's one of the very few sets in the game that is much better uh, when used to support another set.
All right, next up looks like we got Plume. Plume is another set that I'd say is pretty balanced. It's it's good. It's got some really good stuff in it. It's got some of the best um, anti-meta components in it that you'll find. Um, the main character being able to just straight up uh, swoop in and steal one of your opponent's uh, event cards is really good. Just being able to look at your opponent's hand is really good. Um, and the fact that you can not only look at your opponent's hand, but also steal something, um, and then see if it's an okay time to drop your win condition is really nice. Um, and there's some really, really, again, fun stuff you can do within the plume set on just that one character alone. So, for example, um, if you're playing a Demon Eater deck, then you uh, play plume, you drop main character girl, look at your opponent's hands, steal one of their events, and if that event is something that you're not planning on using, then you just drop it face down, and it's essentially like she gives you a free face down character to start uh, working your Demon Eater deck with. So, I mean, there's some really fun stuff that uh, this deck can do. On top of that, it has a healer within it. That is huge. And... Um, honestly, I'd say that yellow has one of the best traits in the entire game. The ability to attack without um, having to exhaust yourself is pretty huge in a lot of cases, because most games will devolve into um, full swing with my entire field, and then during my opponent's turn, they full swing with their entire field, um, and we're both just kind of looking for that one game-ending attack. And if you can uh, get tireless onto one of your big, beefy, four-power characters, I mean, there's not much your opponent can do about it at that point. I swing for four, your turn, I block for four. Like, that's really, really, really good. Um, so, yeah, I mean, overall, I'd say that within its own ecosystem, again, Plume is extremely balanced. Um, it's got a healer. It's got a really, really good main uh, card to drop on your opponent, lets you look at your opponent's hand. Um, it's, it's really, really good on its own. And again, its events are pretty decent. Now, its true value comes in, though, just like with Blinth, its true value comes in when you actually pair it up as a support faction to other factions. Um, again, the whole being able to look at your opponent's hand and steal something is good, but the tireless thing is good enough on its own to use yellow as a support color for another faction. You can uh, use something with a little bit of power behind it, like Dauntless or Edge or any superhero faction, um, and then you give them tireless and it makes them even worse to play against. It's very, very toxic, but... It's also a lot of fun. Now, I'd say that, again, like with Blinth, too, um, one of the things that Plume suffers from is the fact that it has a lot of dead weight in it. It's got um, very, very low-power vanillas, and uh, the guy that uh, prevents damage, or the next damage that would be dealt to a character during the turn he's played, it's not that good. <laughs> he's actually pretty bad, so... I don't really count him among your main fielding characters. So, um, if you oh. so if you can play around an actual faction with actually good characters that hit the field, um, and just give those characters tireless, or um, I'm completely discounting here just how good the uh, long journey event card is. Uh, you just whoop, time to go. If your opponent uh, can destroy a character on your side of the field, you, oh, I'm going to go ahead and scoop him back up into my hand and then uh, play him again. And again, with weaken effects, it's even better. Uh, if you weaken a character for an effect, then you can heal it with the chick that comes into play and heals a character. And then you weaken it again for its effect again. Whoop, and then you long journey it back into your hands, and then you play it fresh, and then you weaken it for a third time during that turn, and you get its effect a third time. Um, overall, it, it brings a lot to the table. It is one of the best support factions in the game, in my personal opinion. <sighs> no, okay, next up we got Tech Gal. Um, well, we had to, we had to talk about this at some point. 
Oh. Uh, I need, I need coffee for this one. Um. I'm not going to lie to you guys. Tech Cal sucks. <laughs> Tech Cal's real bad. <laughs> um. Uh. Tech Cal is. Well, it's it's unbelievable how bad Tech Gal is right now for a couple of reasons. Okay, let's go ahead and start with this. Tech Gal's location is an insult to the game itself with how bad it is. Not only does it need a slice of life character to run when this is the only faction in the entire game right now that has slice of life the only other slice of life faction has been uh thanos snapped out of existence right now so right now they're the only slice of life characters in the game um not only does it need that but to get its true value you need a robot character now going back to what i was talking about before with how powerful face down characters are you can just play a character face down on your side of the field as an all-color uh, character and then tap that to get the card draw, and it's what you have to do most of the time. But what are you going to do about the no robots thing, right? As far as I can tell, there aren't any other factions that play with robots. It's only Tech Gal. And what's worse than that is the fact that they took Tech Gal's Thunder by making a far superior version of this location for Edge. Because superheroes just get everything, right? It's, superhero factions just get to be the best in every single category. They never have to worry about having any downsides, or they never have to worry about consistency, or worry about having any flaws whatsoever. With Tech Gal, though, there are exactly two robots in the entire faction so if you don't have either of those robots you just don't get to play uh your location's effects to its fullest ability you have to play face down characters or you have to sacrifice and that's the other thing too the two robots that you have are two of the characters that you want to be attacking with or blocking with so you have to sacrifice so much power in order to actually use them I don't understand why they couldn't just all all five of the characters just have robot in them somewhere. Just robot technician, uh, robot uh, butler, just have um, robot enthusiast, just have robot on all of them so it all works, or uh, put something within the uh, the location that just makes it a little bit better. The location's awful. Now, luckily, you can get around that by just not using their location, using somebody else, but right now we're talking about them just as a whole without taking anything else into account. So let's go ahead and keep talking about it. Um, the other problem with Tech Gal is they have a five-power character, which is great. Okay, love to see it. But, again... Since Tech Gal isn't a superhero faction, they have to deal with the fact that their their actions have consequences. So, their five power character can't attack. Now, Brain Blast here, I see there's a character here that can negate other characters' effects. So, what you can do is you can negate that character's effect saying that it can't attack so that you get a five power attacker. That's kind of neat. A neat little synergy there. Um, it rewards you for playing in a uh, smart, consistent way. If you can manage to get both of them on the fields, then you get yourself a 5-power attacker. And if you can't get both of the pieces on the fields, then at the very least, you have a 5-power blocker. That's cool. But, again, it's not superheroes where you can just get a 5-power vanilla that never has to worry about that, but I digress. Um, outside of that, Tech Gal's effect kind of sucks like the main character's effects it kind of sucks there really aren't very many good battle trick effects that you can block with her effect if anything she's just a much weaker version of a character that exists within shadow hunters that can just weaken to cancel character abilities um you really have to pull off that one combo and i gotta be honest with you that one combo is not even that impressive 
is really not that good. Um, if there was like one more power on uh, the big robot butler guy, then it'd be much better because um, the power threshold for a lot of characters is three. And if he were six power, then you could step over three power characters completely and just obliterate them off the field if they try to block. But I mean, if your opponent has a three power character, they're kind of okay right now. They block, they take the damage, and then they can block the next turn, or they can just heal that character back up if they want to. Um, and because that character has five power, everybody else suffers. Every character, I'm, and I want, I'm going to say this loud for the people in the back, every character is really bad. <laughs> The only good combo you have is so contingent on you getting those two specific characters out on the field and sacrificing so much in order to make it happen. Because if you use this effect, you have to have a character on your side of the field that isn't attacking, and you have to sacrifice its ability to um, negate any of your opponent's battle tricks in order to fix your character and have your character do something useful. Tech Girl got it wrong. <laughs> Which sucks, because when it comes to, like, artwork in the world, I love robots. Robots are so cool. Mechs and, like, mecha anime and that kind of stuff. Love it. Love robots and technology. Love the artwork for Tech Girl. Um, really, really love it as a concept. But is it good? No. It is, it is the worst, or sorry, one of the worst factions in the entire game so far. Now, when it comes to helping out other factions, does it bring anything useful? Now again, if you take into consideration that if it's supporting a different faction, you don't have to worry about how god-awful your characters are. It kind of does. Um, I'd say that its events are fairly... Its events are fairly okay. I wouldn't say that they're great. Um, I think that... I think that Slim probably thinks they're a little bit better than they actually are, but they're not that good. Um, so, for one thing... Um, one thing that Slice... Excuse me, one thing that Slice of Life is known for, or it's supposed to be known for, is it's supposed to reward you for having less characters in play, right? The more empty slots you have, the better it's supposed to play. Problem is... The problem is... Uh, it's a faction that seems to want you to draw lots of cards. Its location is all about drawing cards. One of its events is all about drawing cards. And if you're drawing all this crap then the advantage of that is you're supposed to be able to, to play it. <laughs> if you're going to draw, like, four cards in a turn, then normally the reason you want to do that is you want to play oh, four cards on the field, right? Like, I'm not, I'm not the crazy one here, right? And you can't really, like, because there's no um, deck manipulation within this game, you can't really uh, say that, oh, because I want to have more fields open, I'm going to make a very magey sort of style deck where half of my deck is just event cards you're you're kind of you're kind of stuck with uh 12 event cards no matter what and two of them are the ones that let you draw more cards but the thing that saves it okay the thing that truly saves it is okay i know earlier i was talking up uh just how good yellow's trait is Blue might have the best trait in the game. It's very close. Um, Blue's trait is just straight up negating event cards. Getting four cards in your deck that negate event cards is... It's so good that just those four cards alone um, are enough to raise the tier of like any other faction. Um, event cards are such an integral part of the game. If you derail one of your opponent's event cards, it's over. And the coolest thing about it is it doesn't even take up a slot to negate an event card. They play an event card, you negate it, and both cards are discarded. Which is great. It's actually, it's actually really good. Um, I just, I, I wish the set was better, 
but the the trait itself is good and really tech girl's the only place you're going to be getting that trait right now so yeah I, that's kind of it all right next up we got damage ink um damage ink is extremely impressive it's a very 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 well made set um possibly even a little bit too good um there's very little holding this back from making it into s tier but it's a lot more balanced than you're going to find with something like dauntless there's, there's a lot more hurdles that you have to jump through um damage ink is just really good one it, it does what it says on the tin it does deal a lot of damage um in particular it has one of the coolest characters in the entire game where every time it attacks you reveal the top card of your deck, and if that dude is a character, then one of your opponent's characters is taking some damage. Um, you combine that with the event card that deals a da another damage, and you can just straight up Rochambeau a character out of existence. A um, lot of really cool things you can do with damaging. Now, I'd say that within its own ecosystem, it just it works almost flawlessly. Um, the main character's effect where he gives a character minus one impact is, I really hate to say it, it's very impactful. It has a lot of impact on the game um, because everybody's so close in power that subtracting one from your opponent's uh, characters makes it a, an even trade with a normally four power character or just a straight up victory with a three power character. Um, and if you combine that with um, its trait, the red trait, that uh, lets you deal a damage on attack, I, it's pretty good. <laughs> it's not bad. It's really, really not bad. Um, and it stands pretty far above other sets uh, that do roughly the same thing. Like this, Damage Inc. is a much better version of the Lucha Mystery um, set. Um, on its own, I would say that it's about on par with uh, Next Reaper, but obviously it's a lot better um, than it's a lot better than something like Shadow Hunters, right? Um, it's significantly better. If in fact, if I were ordering these, um, and as far as like power goes, I'd say that Damaged Ink might actually be like like number one or number two within the A tier. Um, it's very, very overloaded. It's got very, very good effects. It's got some of the best field control that you're going to find in the entire game. Um, and it's just, it's very impressive. It's very fun to play with. Um, it's, it's good without being superhero broken, is the way that I can put it. So yeah, without its own ecosystem, Damage Inc. is incredible. Now, when it comes to what it brings to the table... In a group setting, does anything change? I don't think so. I think this is going to be one of those rare occurrences where um, I don't think whether you're using it as your main faction or you are pairing it up with something else uh, to support their faction, I don't think it brings any less to the table. Um, you're always going to love the event cards that this set comes with. Um, it has one of the craziest cards in the entire game uh, in the form of its um, Into the Dark, which uh, can either be used to negate a character's effects, uh, make a character one power to make it very easy to step over. Um, it can be used to... Uh, one of my personal favorite uses is it's the only way in the game right now to reflip your flip effect characters, which is something that <laughs> Eli, Eli, please, I'm begging you for the sake of Demon Eater. I will, I promise you, I will raise them both like two tiers if you just include more stuff in the game that lets you reflip care flip effect characters. Um. Damage Inc. actually lets you reflip your freaking characters. It's crazy. It's so good. Um, the, Into the Dark is just, it's an incredible card. It's nowhere near as good in power as, like, you know, Blinth being able to steal characters or uh, Next Reaper being able to just straight up Monster Reborn something from the discard pile. It's not that good, but. 
as far as utility goes, it's pretty amazing. Uh, that character is now one power, or that character is now face down, so it doesn't have an effect anymore. Or uh, I flip over my Alex in boots, uh, I destroy a character, then into the dark I flip it back over, and now it's going to get to use its effect again this game. Um, overall, Damage Inc. is just, it's a very, very impressive faction. And again, I think it's, I think it's teetering on S tier. It's so close to S tier. The only thing keeping it from S tier is, again, it's just in comparison to what superheroes can do, there's just, it's too balanced. <laughs> it's, there's a lot of fodder within the set. Um, there's two really good characters, and the event cards are above average they're very very good one of them possibly even being great but um there's too much dead weight on the there's too much dead weight within uh the faction to really call it anything above that so yeah it's it's really really good it's one of the best factions that you can play right now <laughs> little warrior I don't even I don't even want to talk about Little Warrior. What happened? What happened to this set when it was being made? I got really excited about this set because um Blint being my favorite set and then you know next Reaper coming in as a close second. Um the tragedy is kind of where I'm at, and you get a lot of tragedy value out of Little Warrior. And if you just read the cards once, it seems like Little Warrior is really good. But then, you think about it. And I'm just going to say it. Someone needs to say it. Yes, that's got to be me. Little Warrior is the worst set in the entire game. Little Warrior is the anti-Dauntless. Where... Dauntless is just so overloaded with good stuff. Little Warrior, I'm pretty sure the tragedy subgenre comes from the fact that all the cards are real bad and it feels really bad to play in all cases. <laughs> um, I don't even know where to start. Okay, I guess let's start with the title character. So, your main character guy can go back on top of your deck if he would ever be exiled. Can you play around this? Yes. Because it doesn't specify where he has to be exiled from. Which means if you were to exile him with Blint's effect, or if you were to exile him on the field with a Blind's effect, no matter what, he gets to go back on top of your deck. Okay. Alright. Can you play around that? Can you draw him the same turn that he goes on top of your deck. Yes, you can technically do that. If you really want to, I guess. You're into that kind of thing. Um, would you want to? Well, that's where we start getting a little bit of a hiccup. Little homie's just a two-power character. He may as well be a two-impact vanilla. Like, I don't... I, I think, okay, all right, so, I get, I get it. I get what he's supposed to do, right? If you have a deck that exiles a lot of stuff, then normally that means that your deck count goes down a lot. You normally sacrifice a little bit of deck count to keep your shenanigans going. So the point of... Little warrior guy is he's supposed to mitigate that a little bit and make it a bit easier because if you just keep targeting him with um if you keep targeting him with exile effects, then you get a little bit more value out of your deck. Okay. Okay. I get it. I see what was I see what's I see what you're doing. It does not work that well. It's definitely not worth a title character. And he doesn't even make a good attacker because he's only got two traits. <laughs> like, if you're gonna make him this, 
mediocre, at least give him a third trait to be. That would be kind of cool if he was always like a guaranteed attacker. I don't know, man. He doesn't do like anything. And then you've got my personal favorite guy in this. Holy crap. Iron Bow is the epitome of everything wrong with this set of cards. Okay. Iron Bow. Iron Bow has four strength. He is meant to be your main trump card. He has all the power. He's the one you're going to be attacking with and blocking with. And his effect text is... That you can erase him from the game to untap a character. Now you may be asking yourself, wait a second, Kudo. Doesn't that mean that you can totally get a, a you can exhaust a character for his for an effect, and then you can iron bow out of existence? You can throw Iron Bow to the void and then untap that character and do their effect again. There is one, one character in the whole game right now that exhausts for an effect. Everybody else is weakened for an effect and he doesn't do anything to help that. Even if there were more, he erases himself from the game in order to untap a character. Slim, I don't want to erase him. He is the best card in the in the set. I don't want to lose him. Why why do I have to sacrifice him to untap a character? That doesn't make any sense. And don't get me wrong, okay, I totally see some viability in untapping a character. It's your opponent's turn, and you need a blocker. You can flip, and then untap a character, and then you hustle, you have a blocker. But why do that to the only decent card within your character lineup? He's the only character that got any power within his faction. He's the only one. Everybody else is two power. He has four power. And unfortunately, they're not superheroes. <laughs> it's kind of can't keep going on about it. Unfortunately, they're not superheroes, so they're stuck at the 12 impact limit. Okay, they don't they don't get to be superheroes who can have like 20 20 power within uh, a set because and have amazing effects. So they can't do that. Okay, they they've got to play by regular people rules. Okay, all right. Let me calm down for a second. If he has to erase himself from the field to do his effect, okay, I'm going to assume, I'm going to give benefit of the doubt here, that. There is something within the lore of Little Warrior that involves him erasing himself, leap blooping out of existence, and that's an important integral part of his character. If that's the case, it has to be better than what it currently is, okay? If I have if I have access to one four power character and his one effect requires him to kill himself, and not even in a way that I can recycle, to kill himself permanently unless I'm playing with blinks, I guess, then I better get something cool. I better unexhaust my entire field, <laughs> right? If I have to erase him in order to do the effect, then I better get so much value out of him being erased. I better get all of my field um unexhausts and everybody gets plus one impact. Or uh when he erases himself from the game, I get to search my deck for a card and put that card in my hand. 
that's the level that a card needs to be in in power for me to think him erasing himself is anywhere near a, a good idea. Okay, so Iron Bow, he should be good, but he sucks. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about White Stag, because I've got some things to say about White Stag, too. So once per turn, that's your turn and your opponent's turn. I've already checked. You can erase some cards from your discard pile to ready characters. Okay. It's better. It's better than the bow. But again, having to get rid of cards from your discard pile makes this very limiting. It's a little bit too balanced. Just a little bit. If it were a flat cost, something like uh, pay, uh, to get rid of the top two or the top three cards of your discard pile, this would be a decent effect. But, but it's not. If you want to get something really good, then you're giving up like four or five cards from your discard pile. And... You're playing on a 22-card deck every single game. That's a quarter of your deck that first has to go into the discard pile, but then you also have to get rid of for this effect, which is really rough because also you don't necessarily want to be getting rid of cards from your discard pile for this effect. You normally want to be pairing stuff like this up with Blinks, and Blinks kind of need your discard pile to do stuff. It's just not that good. This whole readying characters thing, it's a neat idea, but it is the worst executed idea that I've seen in the game so far. And as though that weren't bad enough, Let's talk about event cards for a second. The event cards that Little Warrior has access to are not bad. They are completely fine. One of them exhausts a character, or you can give a character one impact. Okay. That's totally fine. It's whatever. Hey, I get you. I see where you're coming from. It's a pretty good effect. The other one automatically makes a character win a battle. Okay. Pretty good. I can see the applications. Your opponent's coming at you with big, beefy, 10 impact superhero character. You gotta block with something. You win that battle. Okay. I get it. It's cool. It's good. The traits... The trait of yellow is that it gives a character tireless. Which means... <laughs> which means a character doesn't exhaust when it attacks. <clears throat> Okay. I'm going to very calmly ask a question. What is the point? What is the point of the only decent characters in the set being able to unexhaust a character if they have four cards in their set that can just make it so a character never has to tap to attack. Never gonna tap to use an effect. We don't have tap effects. All the effects are weakened effects. The only time they would tap is if they were attacking. I can't. I can't keep going. I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't say another word about it. I'm kidding. It's, I'm so frustrated. 
I'm so frustrated because it's, like, it's one of those things. Like if you just if you just ask something, if you just check with one person, they can tell you that this isn't a good idea. I can't. It's it's the worst set in the game. It is the worst set in the game. Can you win with it? Sure you can. Okay, you pair up little warrior with uh, dauntless. You're you're totally fine. You you make the dauntless characters um, tireless, and uh, you're you're good to go. It, you exhaust the fields. You make your characters tireless, and then that that makes your win conditions even better. Um, you play it with something like uh, the um, dog of the dead. Sure, there's there's some potential there, but it is by far the worst set in the game and you should not choose to play with it unless you are only trying to have some fun and in case you were wondering if it brings anything to the table for another set like like tech gal does no it really doesn't if you're after this trait there are better ways to get it just play with Plume. Plume is a million bazillion times better than Little Warrior. Just don't play Little Warrior. Just don't do it. Okay? Unless you're challenging yourself, just trying to have some fun, or if you're a fan of the comic that it comes from, if you're a, a low-tier god, go ahead and rock Little Warrior. Otherwise, pretend it doesn't exist. Okay, um, as a complete juxtaposition to everything that I just said about Little Warrior, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about Alien 101. Now, um, Alien 101 on its own, it's interesting. It's got some of the most powerful tools in the entire game. But I'd say that on its own, it's actually... It's impressive. It's really, really good. Is it, like, S-tier good? Not really. I wouldn't say that it's that good. It really doesn't have a win condition in it is the problem. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and just get this over with real quick. Um, it's stronger than average. Again, it's got some insane healing stuff, and healing is, like, the coolest and best thing in the game. Um, you get so much value out of healing characters. It's got access to Pink Lemonade, which in any other card game would be an awful card. Nobody likes cards that uh, you, you play it and then you uh, put X cards back and draw X cards. It's always going to lead to negative one-hand advantage. Um, the only reason that Pink Lemonade gets a pass in this game, though is you draw cards at the end of your turn um, to replace the cards that you play during that turn. So, because you're always drawing up to five cards, if you play Pink Lemonade and you go down to four cards in your hands, then you're going to get to replace that Pink Lemonade at the end of the turn. So that makes it actually a pretty good card. Um, but on its own, just within its own ecosystem, Alien 101 is extremely well made. But it cannot win. It uh, just if you just pair it up by itself against all the other factions, um, it's got the best tools in the game, and nothing to actually use those tools on, <laughs> is the way I'd say. In fact, it's bordering on not even being in A. It's like right here between these two spots. It's either really high up in the B tier, with the other balanced. Uh, sets or it's on the very very bottom of stronger than average on its own however and anybody who has played this game for at least a day should see this coming pairing this up with another faction this is the best support that you can possibly give to any other set. It's very difficult to make like high quality um, meta tier decks without always just throwing Alien 101 in as one of the factions. 
Um, if you want a deck to be at least like within these first three tiers, um, I think it has to have Alien 101. I, I don't think there's an option. Um, but let's go and talk about why. Okay, first things first. Man the Weirdo is like the best card that you're going to get in when it comes to utility. And its utility is one of the craziest things that I've ever seen in any card game ever. So its effect lets you draw the top two cards of your discard pile, which means that if you've just played a couple of really good um, event cards, you have a way of recycling those then playing them again. And then, you know, of course, if you're supporting another set, then you find a way to bounce him back to your hand, play him again, and you get to draw two more cards. So if you want to, you can replay both of those event cards. You know, you got yourself a, you got yourself like a blimp deck, and you're pairing that up with, I don't know, uh, next Reaper, and you can just kind of recycle stuff over and over again. You play Mun, you get the two things back, and then uh, you put Mun back in your hands, you drop them again, you get those two things back again, you can just play those two cards over and over again for the rest of the match if you really want to. Um, on top of that, he's ridiculously good because if you hold him in your hands and wait for your opponent to do something to your win conditions he can dig those win conditions back out he's a little bit like a revive spell because if your opponent uh damage inks or something his way uh into getting rid of your best characters then man comes into play and those two characters or that character, rather, goes back to your hand, along with another card, and then you can play him again. So it's like reviving a character. Um, ridiculously good. There's not a single faction in the game now, and I will go on record saying this, there's not a single faction that will be released in the future that will not get value out of how good man is by himself. Um, it's got a character that you play them and you get to just straight up draw a card, and then it shuffles um, a couple of... I'm sorry, it doesn't shuffle. It uh, puts um, cards from the discard pile back on the bottom of the deck uh, to keep you from decking out. It's also really good as a sort of anti, like, blinth, for example, where you can just put cards from your opponent's discard pile back into their deck. Um, if they have any combo pieces in there you need to get rid of, you can sort of anti-mun, because you can play the chick and then put the bottom sorry put the top two cards into the bottom of the deck and then man can't use them as targets um and it's another cool thing about man is when you take damage or when your opponent forces you into taking a little bit of damage normally those cards are gone forever you just don't get access to them it can suck real bad when some of your title characters are gone because of damage that you decided to take um very very unlucky you have man in your hand, then you get those cards back in your hand, and oh, <laughs> in a way, taking that damage was really good for me because now I have those two cards in my hand that I need. So, yeah, man by himself, ridiculously good. In every single deck, is he good? But so that weren't good enough, <laughs> we also have um, some really interesting plays that you can do with the traits. So, the traits for romance are you can heal a character and then make that character uh, romance. So, that means that you can synergize your attacks better, because not only do you get to heal a character, but you get to make them uh, pink. And if you're doing a deck that has a lot of pink in it, then you're just making more consistent attack patterns. But the thing that makes us really good is, of course, the fact that Weaken is such a huge part of the game. Weaken, Pink Lemonade trait to heal him back. Weaken to use this effect again. And you can use another pink trait, heal him back. Weaken again. That's, it's just so much value. And that's not even getting into what I would argue is probably one of the best cards in the entire game right now. Um, 
give it up for the one card in the game that still exhausts to use her effect. Um, her effect is, it's, it heals a character. What can you possibly say that hasn't been said about it already? She's a problem. She's a win condition on her own. Her plus any weakened character is a win condition by itself. Every single weakened character has a ridiculously good effect. If you pair them up with her, the only decent healer in the game that can use her effect every single turn, you're unstoppable. <laughs> Just those two cards alone are something that your opponent's going to have to deal with, and the entire time they're trying to deal with that, you could be winning with a completely different set of cards over here on the side. It's crazy how good it is. Um, everybody knows that, though. I'm not, I'm not adding anything to the conversation here by pointing that out. Um, everybody knows that she's, she's good. I don't even remember her name. What was her name? One second. I <laughs> need no pressure. Marie. Marie Studious. Marie Studious is one of the best cards in the entire game. Um, any competitive deck is going to need that, and then, like, decent weakened characters. Um, I, I really don't think anybody's going to deserve that. Uh, she's... <laughs> She's, she's ridiculously good. Marie plus four pink traits plus man makes just about any deck unstoppable. It is the best support you can get for a deck. And, and that's not even mentioning the generic stuff that it does that's really good. Um, it's got an event that bounces a character. Obviously, that's good. Pink Lemonade, once again... Normally, it's not that great, but if you have a very combo-heavy deck, this is one of the best ways to ensure that you get that combo off and you do not lose anywhere near as much hand advantage as you do in other games by playing a card like Pink Lemonade um, because of the way that the game mechanics actually work. I mean, what can I say? It's the best support in the entire game. Okay, we're, we're so close to done. Let's go ahead and keep going. Aurora. So Aurora, I would say, is one of the most interesting sets that are in the game right now. But does interesting equal good? That's a tough one. Let's go ahead and talk about it. As a solo set, within its own environments, taking its own cards into account, not taking into account that it's being used to empower another set. Is it good? No. It's actually pretty bad. Um, one of the worst. I'm comfortable saying that it's one of the worst, and I'll explain why. This set is capable of doing some really cool stuff. Um, but... It, it, needs, it needs to be enabling another set to do anything. Um, let's go and talk about some of the cards it has. So one of the cards it has that's probably the most impressive is the one that is uh, two impact when it's in the front row, but if it gets moved to the back row, then becomes uh, four impact. That's, it's, it's cute. It's a really neat effect. But the problem is... There are four impact vanilla characters in the game. Four impact is not that impressive. In fact, there's another character within the set that also has four impact all the time, including in the front row. So, not that impressive. It's not that good, right? It's, it's interesting. I wouldn't say that it's not interesting. It's very interesting. But power-wise, it's not that impressive. It's just not that good. Um, it has what I would argue is one of the most interesting cards in the entire game in that there's a character that if you give it a trait, you can weaken him to then use the effect text on that trait. That is very, very, very interesting game design. I like that a lot. But also, the event card that Aurora got is pretty bad. So, 
Can't really make any use out of that. Um, it's got some generic vanilla characters, whatever. Um, Power-wise, it's just very balanced. Its title character can negate damage, but the problem is um, it doesn't negate damage anywhere near as good as its event card does. Um, I actually... I kind of wish... Uh, I kind of wish Slim had just manned up a little bit and and made the title card character just a little bit better. If it were something like, if a character on your side of the field is going to take damage, maybe uh, this dude can jump in and stop the damage, but also something else happens. Maybe something like... Um, I don't know, maybe deal a damage back to the character that was going to get damaged if it if it's like, or like deal a damage on your opponent's side of the field, maybe like reflecting the damage. I don't know. Maybe e even something as simple as negate the damage, he takes the damage, also draw a card. Even something as simple as that would have made it a lot better, but it's just not that impressive on its own. And that's the title character. And the title character's not good. Not that good. There are uses for him. It's not Little Warrior bad, but, I mean, it's not that good. Um, which is shocking. This is, like, the only superhero set in the entire game. It just isn't that good. <sighs> but anyways, okay. So, on their own, they're just not that good. Not much to say about it. They're not that good. However, this is the biggest leap of any set in the game. When you use them as a support faction, they go straight up to stronger than average. Um, that one character being able to infinitely recycle an event card is nuts in theory if you can continuously heal that character and then re-weaken him to use that event card over and over and over again then you've got a real problem on your hands there are some really good event cards that he can recycle um we haven't talked about it yet but dog of the dead Dog of the Dead has a card that gets cards back from the discard pile. You do that every single turn. You can have an infinite supply of dudes on your side of the field. Let's talk about Blinth. Blinth lets you take control of a character. You give his uh, event card to Aurora, and Aurora steals a character every single turn from your opponent's side of the field if you have a way to heal him every turn. Um... Very, very impressive. It's a very, very good card. Um, and on top of that, you can sort of make up for some of the weaknesses that the rest of the cards have. Um, the title character is not good in his own set, but if you pair him with another set that needs protection, then it's a lot better. Uh, if you pair up the event card that they get with other sets to keep them alive so that they can keep comboing, or with weakened characters who, if your opponent deals one more damage to them, they die, you can sort of dodge that damage over and over again to keep them alive so you have a chance to heal them and keep recycling their effects. That's pretty good. Um, yeah, overall, um, as a support color, like there's just so much value that you get out of having Aurora as your support. Um, their traits aren't that great, but, I mean, you wouldn't really want to play them for their traits anyway, right? <laughs> You're not gonna do that. You're gonna be playing them specifically so that you get uh, one guy that can absorb all your damage, and then a bunch of event cards that also absorb a bunch of damage so that your opponent um, can't just one-shot your stuff off of the field. Very, very good anti-meta against um, a lot of the other uh, decks, because a lot of decks have things within them that deal a ton of damage. So, overall, 
Aurora sucks on its own, but when you pair it up with something else, it's some of the most value that you're going to get out of um, any kind of set. Okay, let's wrap this bad boy up. So, Dog of the Dead, totally fine on its own. No complaints. Um, in fact, I would argue that Dog of the Dead, on its own, it's, it's probably... Uh, is it as good as Edge Support? Uh, maybe. Okay, so it's it's definitely on the higher tier of balanced. It's it's really good. Um, Alex and Boots is one of the best title characters. They might be the best title character now that I think about it. Huh. Flip effects. Flip. Auto destroy a character. And also heal a character. Trying to think, is there a character that's better than that? A title character? Man, man is better than that. But I mean, other than that, they might be the best title character, if I'm being real. Other than that one, they're pretty good. So, Alex and Boots, very, very good. The vanillas in this deck are three power. That actually makes them pretty good. Most vanillas are coming with two power. So having three power makes you stronger than all the other vanillas. Obviously, you're not as good as like the four power vanillas, but I want to talk about that. Um, you have a little bit of dead weight in uh, Yappy. Yappy is not a good card. Yappy is a pretty bad card. Um, it sounds like it'd be a cool card because... You know, you give minus one to your opponent's entire board. Not that good, though, honestly. If there were a way that you could reflip him, it could be good. It's just not that good. Um, And then finally, you've got Zombie Horde. I like Zombie Horde a lot, but it's shockingly hard to play around. If you If you don't mind taking a little bit of damage... Then um, you happen to get like zombie horde in that damage that you're taking. Them coming into play is really cool, um, and I really like it a lot. I like it a lot. I like the card, but if I'm looking at it objectively, they're just they're just okay. They're about they're very balanced. Now um, they do have above average. Uh, synergy with their events. Their events are extremely good. Um, being able to target non-romance characters and destroy them is really good uh, for a couple of reasons. One, normally cards only bounce back to hand, but this is one of their rare factions that can just straight up merc a dude right out of right off the field you don't you're not going back to the hand you're going to the discard pile where you belong okay um and all you have to do is sacrifice the character on your side of the field it's not even specific which character that you have to get rid of if i'm not mistaken let me double check myself here yeah no i'm right i i don't know why i doubt myself yeah you don't even have to destroy like a specific character so that's crazy. <laughs> it's really good. Um, you 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 destroy any character you control, including ones that you stole from your opponent, and one of their characters is just dead. It's very nice. You also have a card that revives characters. So you know, Alex and Boots. You you get them out there. You flip them. You have a good time. Then you sacrifice them for Zombie Bite. And then they come back and play. And then on top of the, getting that character back into play, you also heal a character. And the cool thing about it is it's on an event card, so you can do it during your opponent's turn. You know, you swing in with Alex, you flip it, your opponent thinks that's all they have to deal with. And then on your opponent's turn, you, you sack them for zombie bite, and then you revive them, and then heal another character. It's pretty good on its own. It's not bad. The only reason that I would say that it's more balanced than it is uh, in the higher tiers is because um, 
this is another one of those sets that runs out of steam very, very quickly. Uh, once you've done your tricks, they don't really have enough raw power to keep up with your opponent. You have to be very, very careful. Um, you can lose to bad luck with Dog of the Dead more than you can most other sets. Um, I mean, it's really tough. You have to, you have to accept that you're going to have to take a little bit of damage to get value out of your zombie horde. Um, you've got really good control, but without some kind of oomph to back you up, you cannot finish a game with Dog of the Dead. They are extremely good early to mid game, and then if you haven't gotten a significant amount of advantage in the early and mid game, they don't do a single thing in late game. I don't want to hear anybody say that they do. They don't. Um, they're just very, very inefficient at actually closing a game out. They they clear the way for other sets. They are not good at finishing games themselves. Which brings us to, uh, you probably saw this one coming, but when you use them as support for another set, that's where they really shine. They're very, very good at supporting other factions. Um, your zombie bite, very, very good at clearing the field. Um, your little Alex and Boots kill something, and then they die, and then you revive them. Um, and then you get to heal something is really good. Their location card, where you can sacrifice romance characters to heal characters on your side of the field, is also really, really good. Again, especially with weaken effects. You weaken a character... You sacrifice a character on your side of the field to heal that weakened character. You re-weaken them, you get their effect again. Very simple stuff. Um, and once again, I, I've said this a couple of times now, but I'll say it one more time so that everybody remembers. You can put a card face down on the field that you do not need, and that is a romance character. Face down card sacrifice the face down card to heal a character it basically turns every single card in your hand into you can discard this card to heal a character ridiculously good super good location one of the best locations yeah uh this went on <laughs> a lot longer than i was expecting it to but i had a lot of stuff to say again this was originally going to be 14 separate videos so of course, if, if it's all going to be in one long video like this, of course it's going to be a lot longer than usual. But I digress. No reason to drag this out any longer than it needs to. Um, I'm sure that you have your own opinions. And once again, I'd like to remind you that you are free to click on the Tier Maker link right there in the description and share that link on with the rest of the Scattered Nexus community. And we can compare notes. You can tell me how wrong I am in the comment section below. And hopefully one day we'll get a game in.